Good afternoon. Welcome to this IDE webinar uh, on the topic of big data. Big data is currently one of the most frequent topics in business ethics discussions and in business discussions more generally. Um, and whilst uh, protection of privacy is seen as the main concern by many, it's certainly not the only one. Um, and we've seen some research by a US firm called Gartner who estimate that by 2018, in fact, 50% of business ethics violations will occur through the improper use of uh, big data analytics. Um, this is a topic that's, that's been on the IBE's agenda for a while. Uh, we, uh, last week we launched uh, our own business ethics briefing on the topic, um, which you are able to download from the IBE's website. It's also available as a handout uh, on the site, uh, it's on the site of this webinar if you want to have a look at that. But what we thought we'd do with this webinar today is uh, just to continue that discussion um, around the new ethical issues that are raised by by big data. Um, we've scheduled half an hour for this webinar. Uh, we will try our best to keep to that uh, that time, um, although I'm sure this is a topic that could, uh, for the whole afternoon's worth of discussion, if not more. Um, but if at any stage you do have a question during the course of this webinar, um, use, please use the question bar in the panel on the, uh, on the right hand side. You have, please type a question in there um, with allocated some time at the end to respond to all of those. Uh, so we will get to those. Um, in addition, if you have any technical difficulties or any issues on that side, please use the raise your hand function and then one of our team will try and be uh, in contact with you and we'll try to sort that out for you. Um, so now that we've kind of done the housekeeping, I uh, thought we would uh, really kind of get stuck into this conversation. Let me sort of explain how we're going to do it. Um, my name is Dan Johnson. I'm the Research Hub Manager uh, here at the Institute of Business Ethics. Uh, I'm going to sort of facilitate this conversation um, by posing a series of questions uh, to two people sat across the table from me. We've got Simon Webby, the research director here at the IBE. Hi, Simon. Good morning. And, and afternoon. We're, afternoon, yes. Um, we're joined by Olivia Barley Winter, um, who's the policy and research manager at the Broad Statistical Society. So, Olivia, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, so, as we sort of dive into this topic, um, I thought it would be a good place to start would be uh, to have a, a definition of big data can put us in context. So, Olivia, would you mind? Uh, just getting this conversation started by explaining a little bit what we mean about, about big data. Yeah, so um, there's not like one set definition of the term big data, but um, there's for the one um, really useful concept thinking about it has been the uh, four V's that were set out um, in the briefing, in the um, IB's briefing. So uh, the first of those is the volume of data that's correct, collected. So a vast amount of data is generated every second by, by the use of technology. So it's been estimated that every minute of the day, Google receives so four million search queries. And Facebook users share more than two million pieces of content. YouTube users upload hours and hours of uh, videos. Um, so with the growth of digital technology, there's growth of data collection and um, a big challenge of how, how is that data used, how is the value of it harnessed. Um, so, in the 19th century, oil was described as a resource that was there in the ground and underutilized. So, um, data has been compared to that in the present day, and they say that it's the oil of the, of the 21st century. Um, the second V of big data is variety, so there's lots of different types of data available. So while um, data analysts used to kind of have to design their collection methods and go out and find the data at great ex perhaps a great expense, um, now you can, you can find data from, from these technological sources. Um, so it's about how do, you, how do you combine those new sources with the existing or the, the sort of more traditional sources yeah. Yeah. of data. Um, velocity has also increased, so with increasing processing speed and processing power, it's possible to you know, um, get more real-time information rather than looking back to the recent past. Yeah, and this is usually facilitated by the advances in technology, so things like the Internet of Things, which you didn't explicitly mention there, but these, these kind of products that are connected to the Internet and are, are kind of tracking that data all the time, and use of algorithms as well, uh, which has actually provided some really valuable insight, insights from these sort of huge um, sources of information. Um, so they're kind of yeah, the three Vs that we'll, we will uh, kind of be using to frame this, to frame this discussion. Um, 
a really important thing that, that we often talk about here at the IBE is, is trust and trust in business. Like um, All organizations are, are seeking to build trust or even to regain it. Um, and it is an especially pertinent issue with regard to, to data as well. So Olivia, um, at Royal Statistical Society, you've done some research and you've revealed what, you're, what you've labeled as a sort of data trust deficit. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Um, yes, yeah, so some work we did to Smory about uh, a couple of years ago, um, we surveyed um, members of the public to find out what their views were of data sharing, so when organizations share data beyond what they hold themselves. We also asked some general questions about um, trust in how organizations handle data. So here Dan's pulled out um, some of the company examples of how um, the level of distrust, so there is a level of distrust in organizations generally, so that's the general level of distrust you can see, and then the level of trust that they would use your personal data appropriately is what's shown in the, in the right-hand column. Um, so our work um, with Ipsos um, found that uh, people's views depended on what you were using the data for as well. So we kind of drilled down a bit further with further questions of, yeah. and we found that trust um, improved if um, you had safeguards in place. So it's kind of testing certain safeguards and um, depending on what exactly you're using it for. So certain events, certain uses were seen as making sense and people could understand them. Other uses, so actually energy utility companies tracking your daily usage, that didn't attract a very high approval rating. Okay. Um, so kind of real-time information can be quite sensitive when it comes down to personal, uh, personal uses. Okay. Uh, then there's been further work done with, with the public about that, that, those sorts of issues. And they do find that it is, it is case by case. So I think the message that comes out from the research is that um, you shouldn't assume that there's going to be disapproval. You should test what you're doing and communicate it well internally as a starting point. If you can't explain what you're doing to your own organization, then you certainly can't set it out in a way that the general public will be able to understand. And then it's about you know, how do we communicate what our ethics are around how we use data. Yeah, interesting, and it's and it's and it's it correlates with um, research that we've done. Every year, we survey the, the general public to ask them sort of what is their perception of, of data, uh, of, sorry, of companies, not in the context of data. Um, we ask them just how ethically they think business behaving. And sort of over the last few years, we've observed that sort of that trust in business has sort of got stuck at about sort of 60, 40, 60 percent of the public think that. Um, think that businesses are behaving ethically do have some trust in business, whereas actually 40% say they don't. So um, I think what your research was saying as well is that, that while there are sort of general levels of distrust, actually the levels of trust in the way um, organisations are using data is, is lower than actually the general level of, of trust. Yeah, so it's a sensitive topic, and that's especially when it comes to using your personal information. Yeah. I think people have a general expectation that companies would use the information they provide to them to provide the service that they expect them to provide. Um, the, the kind of controversies arise when it's um, allowing, say, a separate analytics firm access to do some work. Um, what, it, what is the purpose of that? How does that benefit the customer? Um, or does it have a, a wider public benefit that means that the public would, that the customers would approve of it being used for that? So the ESRC has done, the um, research councils have done some work to look at um, reuse of company information for statistical research, um, sort of research into the general population, um, you know, what products they buy and, and how they, you know, the public benefit of, um, of sharing that for social research. And they found that they did like focus groups and they found that people's approval did increase when they knew, you know, what purpose of that sharing was. Yeah. But um, yeah, data sharing is, is controversial. Um, and um, what else? Yeah, there, there are some controversial issues. Yeah, at least. of course. And you actually found a difference as well between uh, between the generations in terms of their levels of trust as well, which I get against some. Yeah, that does turn up in quite a lot of surveys, but um, um, we didn't look into the specifics of that. Okay. Um, I'd say that, again, you, you shouldn't generalise that young people are going to be more approving because. 
yeah. there is a lot of interest in like privacy enhancing tools and apps for young people as well. Yeah. So uh, I wouldn't say that they are not interested in privacy. I think that would be an overgeneralization. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, and so, so there's this this sort of there is a lack of trust, but I guess as Olivia's made us aware, it's, it's very difficult to and we should certainly stay away from generalising. Um, a couple of the specific and maybe more ethical issues that arise from sort of the use of data. Um, one of them is customer profiling, um, and while there's lots of benefits uh, for customer profiling on the sort of certainly on the marketing side, um, there are some ethical considerations to be uh, considered. Um, and Simon, could you um, do you have any recommendations for companies that are, that are doing this? Well, I think it's very important to uh, make it clear that when you're getting information or using information that the customer has given you either directly or by their use of their card or whatever it's going to be, that they know that you're using that information, hopefully for their benefit, to, to help that, but they need assurance that it's not going to be used uh, in a way which is going to some way undermine what they, their own personal privacy. Yeah. Privacy is very important and therefore information about the use of data that you do take, uh, uh, normally now it seems, um, needs to be made quite clear. Yeah. And in the, in the briefing we actually referenced an example um, quoting from uh, an article from 2012 in the New York Times which was entitled How Companies Learn of Secrets. Yes. Uh, it tells the story of uh, a US organization uh, who could sort of track the um, behavior changes of their, of their customers um, and basically had applied their sort of algorithms and, and they then sort of understood that what would be from their Changing consumer behaviour patterns, they understood uh, uh, customers become to have become pregnant. They sent out a load of their marketing materials suggesting things that she might like to buy, and, and it turned out that actually she was a she was a young girl that hadn't yet told her family, and then actually it was the family that found out like, from the company uh, marketing campaigns. So yeah, that's right. But I think one must be aware that you can misuse data as much as you can use data. And, and the public's distrust of this is partly because they're not sure how it's being used. Yeah. Um, so that, I think that's a very important area and the assurance, therefore, is, is definitely required. Yeah. Which means, means you need a good policy on this. And it's, and it's also, I guess, as well, it's the, um, as customers, we're not necessarily aware how much, just, just how much companies do know about us as well. Isn't it? So, so I guess there's probably a communications piece around that, around um, around how much companies know about us and what actually they are doing. Um, yes, I think this we mainly think in terms of retail mm -hmm. companies on, on this area, but I think it goes wider than that. Um, companies are collecting information all the time, yeah. it seems, and, and we are mainly unaware that it's being collected, and we, 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 we think it's used in the aggregate, but sometimes it's used specifically. Yeah. And well, that, that, that's a bit that, that worries uh, individuals. I think that's why the trust element is so important here. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so then, linked to all of this is another, another issue, is data security. Um, we've just got some sort of stats coming up here on the screen. Um, data security is a huge issue. We see, um, we see stories coming up in the news all the time about sort of data breaches. Um, but there's been some research in what we're I've got here on the slide, and we're quoting is uh, Dr. Claudia Nattinson, who spoke at our European Business Ethics Forum in January. This is some of the stats that she shared from, from that session. Um, she made the assertion that only 19% of, of organizations actually have the capabilities to detect whether they've had uh, an intrusion, um, which, yeah, so it leaves a high, high percentage of organizations that may not even be aware that they have, uh, they have been on the receiving end of a, of a hack. Um, another really interesting uh, statistic that she shared was this 59% breaches committed by insiders. But often I think the approach that companies take is thinking about protecting themselves from the outside, um, whereas actually um, more than half of data breaches seem to be committed by insiders. Um, and then on average it takes 170 to 180 days to protect a breach. That's half a year we're talking about um, of companies maybe being unaware of data that's been stolen or, or what information they about their customers have. Um, has been taken. So another uh, issue that really needs to be considered is, is data security, and there are a number of ways in which organisations are sort of trying to, to deal with, with that and making sure that they do have those robust policies in place. 
Um, another issue which we've, um, we've touched upon as well is this, this, this informed consent. Um, we've sort of touched upon this, we haven't given it this title so far. Um, data collection is nothing new. Um, for centuries, governments have completed censuses and collected data about their public. Um, however, in the past, data collection was for a very specific purpose, like for a, for a census, you know what information you're handing over. Um, but now this is not so straightforward. Um, data is now commonly being kind of created as a byproduct of action. As Simon was saying, we don't necessarily know the, the data that companies have on us. Um, therefore, it's vitally important that organisations obtain proper and informed consent for the data they're collecting. Commonly, this is through sort of terms and conditions and through sort of social media sites. You you kind of you want to use the product, so you say, yeah, happy. You kind of tick the box and say, yeah, happy for you to use my data. Um, you may get a choice of tick box to say, please do or please don't share my information with third parties. But that's about sort of the level that we've got. So this has opened up a whole new debate about actually um, about this, about informed consent. So Olivia, I wonder if you could sort of just expand on these these arguments. Yeah. So um, I think it's a very tricky issue. I think if you if you rely on the public to let you know every single time you were wanting to do something different with so so there's the notion of explicit explicit consent um, which is that the mem the, the person providing data um, would provide it only for one specific use and they would have to consent to that they would have to be explicit about that particular use before you could use it but if you relied on that for every type of analytics that was done the public would just be bombarded with requests. So um, you see this on, on websites um, that they have um, consent for cookies yeah. um, and who actually bothers to read through precisely what is set out there. Um, so consent is an extremely important principle but it's hard to put into practice mm -hmm. for everything and um, this is why in the research community we have um, other mechanisms um, further mechanisms for certain types of data use. So you have ethics committees to oversee how data has been used. Um, there's a lot of surveys. That don't, and the obligation then is on data protection, on really robust data protection, on training and standards, um, so that the public can have confidence that even though they don't know precisely what use their data is being put to, um, they can have confidence that they're not going to be individually interfered with or affected by that use. Um, it's just for production of knowledge about society, greater public good. Um, so it's about setting up those, purpose those purposes. And privacy activists in particular are very supportive of, supportive of greater transparency and, and you know, developing new transparency mechanisms that, so that you, do, you wouldn't have to uh, approve it every single time, but you would be able to go and see, you know, what what is the policy here, how does it work, and perhaps track what uses your data have been put to, so you can see how oh, it's been used for that beneficial thing and that beneficial thing, and, and then that would build, you know, public trust in the overall enterprise and in the endeavour of, of doing research with data. Interestingly, you, you bring up the, the concepts of sort of ethics councils and committees in, in the research world. Um, I know when we were speaking before, you you mentioned the example of uh, uh, some research that was conducted uh, using data which was uh, accessed from OKCupid. Yeah. Um, an interesting one that, like, again, has polarised a bit of opinion because while technically the, the researchers did nothing wrong, they feel that they've certainly crossed ethical boundaries. Do you want to maybe just give a, a quick overview of that story? Um, yes, so this was a story from last month. Um, it was I can't remember which website it was, but it, the headline was 70,000 OKCupid users have had their data published. And it was a couple of researchers in Denmark had, um, had openly published it. So although um, users could ordinarily see this information if they were logged into the site, um, these researchers had offered it up to the research community. And it, was, it did have a lot of personal details in that people had, had made public within the site, but which they might not be happy to make public in that context. So um, other researchers uh, were quite critical and, and the, the, the researchers who published it did subsequently put it behind a kind of wall. But I think it would still be a, a questionable practice to say the least um, from an ethical point of view. Yeah, and I think that, that was the idea there was it was around sort of semi-public data that became completely public, wasn't it? And it, it 
was okay. Yeah. Okay, Cupid is a dating website for those that don't know. Um, yeah. It's uh, and so there were some sort of very personal. Yes, yeah, very personal you know, sexual preferences yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, you know what things people like or dislike. Um, so those sorts of examples are quite troubling, and I think it was an example where the researchers um, were following the impulse to make their research open to, so that other people could have make other useful findings from it, mm -hmm. but they were neglecting the privacy aspects. Yeah. You know, the privacy dimension does always have to be considered. Mm -hmm. um, Great, thank you. Um, so moving on again, we in the briefing we pose a number of questions at the end um, for which these are predominant, predominantly aimed at those in the ethics compliance function um, to, to really think about in terms of the way their organisation approaches um, approaches the use of data and specifically big data. So um, Simon, could you just uh, run us through these? It's just a selection of these yeah, that come up on the slides. So. Yes, I mean the main point why an ethics practitioner, or those in charge of the of, of um, the values and and their application in an organisation, come in on this is because the law and regulation is is quite a long way behind, and so there's choice, and sometimes people need to get guidance on this, and the ethics officer, or whoever that particular person is who holds that role, really does need to uh, assure or ask questions that assures them that uh, the organization is treating data um, in, in a way that is um, protection of privacy and if you like in, in an ethical way. Mm. Um, so the sort of thing they can ask are, um, uh, well, how far is my organization using big data and um, how far is it involved in using this data as part of its strategic planning and, and overall? So you get an idea of the, of the scale that, that's being used, and therefore the risk that could be there, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's there. And certainly, um, they should ask about the uh, policy with regard to privacy, um, a, a privacy notice, if you like, of some sort or another. Um, is it there? Uh, do you ask permission to collect personal data, uh, or you just assume that because it's available? Um, the, it, permission is given. Uh, this needs to be clarified uh, and set out, I think. Um, the, uh, uh, and the whole business of doing an assessment of the risks for the big data that your organization specifically uses, mm -hmm. maybe not the ones that others do, but there may be particular risks, and at least that question needs to be raised uh, in, in, at policy level, at, at a higher level in, in the organization. Um, and if these risks are identified, what uh, processes to mitigate them are in place, mm -hmm. and do people know about them, and how far is, is that there, um, and do they work is the other question, mm -hmm. um, and, how, and, and getting examples of the way big data is used positively, and perhaps some negative you, you, people always learn more from hearing stories about the negative use of things than the positive ones. Um, sure. But it also means that reputation might be at risk a bit if you, if you do that. But, but on the whole, the openness, uh, the honesty element of this is, is very important. Um, and the other key question is about this of due diligence. When, um, when you're sharing data with a third party, I mean, not all data is retained for your own exclusive use. Um, other people ask for it or have you got information about it and so on. That sort of question uh, should always uh, trigger some form of uh, due diligence about the, the organization that's asking for this. What's their record? What have they done with it? And getting assurance so that your risk in this is mitigated to, to some extent. These are some of the questions that um, uh, an ethics practitioner can um, or ought to perhaps raise and ask about big data, use of big data yeah. in their organisation. Yeah, and I think, I think it's, it's, it's also important to note that, that actually a lot of the messaging around this can be positive. I know that obviously there's a lot of negative uh, stories and the yeah. negative. But actually, the last thing that you want in your organisation is to sort of become the, the ethics police or the people known as the people that say no to everything. So I think that's we try to make that very clear that we're not trying to say 
the Institute of Business Ethics is against big data or that organizations shouldn't use big data. We actually think that actually asking these questions and having those sort of assurances and accountabilities is actually a very positive way to promote um, responsible use of data, which, which does have a number of business benefits, doesn't it? Indeed, indeed it does. Great. So that was kind of everything we wanted to cover. You, you have been sending in your questions to us, which we're going to sort of uh, address now. So um, I'm going to kind of pose these. And again, if you do have any more questions, do send those in. Use the, um, use the bar on the right-hand side to send those in. We've had a question here, um, which is something we, we sort of touched upon, but then didn't go into at all, about um, a fourth, the potential fourth B, uh, which is which often described as veracity. Um, so the question here says, uh, could or should veracity be used as a fourth B as there is a glut of low quality or inaccurate information out there? Um, do you have an opinion on the dilemma that this raises for data owners and users? Um, so I don't know if, yes. if, you want to, if you want to keep us off um, talking about, a bit about veracity and, and thinking about these, these sort of dilemmas. Um, yes, so um, uh, the Royal Statistical Society is an organisation for statisticians and, and analysts, so we're very much concerned with the fourth V and very pleased that it appears in your, in your briefing. Um, so um, I think before, one key element of ethical practice with data is, is that you use it for, that it has utility for your organisation and customers, stakeholders. Um, and if, if what you find is inaccurate, then that's not very useful and all the other hoops you've gone through, you know, the value of those is, is, is reduced. Um, so veracity is really important and I think it comes down to the design of your data set. So um, it's a challenge posed by big data because of the new sources that it contains, the fact that uh, they might be automatically generated by technology. Um, they might not have been designed to be interpreted and analysed. Um, so even though you're, you didn't intentionally design a survey to collect this data, you do have to consider you know, what exactly is it measuring, what's the level of uncertainty in that measurement, and that's what statisticians, you know, that's the bread and butter of what they're interested in, is how accurate is it, how reliable is it, um, how trustworthy is it. So, and that, it, those um, analytical uses um, are what helps tell the stories of, of the value brought to your business. So um, um, Ryan Ayer's head of technology recently um, was interviewed for a, for a piece, um, for a journalistic piece, and said that um, they were actually a, 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 an organization that was skeptical about use of digital technology and use of data. Um, but they did feel they were falling behind, so it's something that they'd be investing in. They still are very, very skeptical about big data, but they're using um, smaller data sets to improve their operations. And you know, he gives a good interview of, of um, how much he said they saved several million in the space of three months yeah. just just from small data projects. Mm -hmm. um, so the case for analytics is clear. If you don't have much of an analytics capability in your organisation, you can arguably say that, that that you wouldn't have much benefit from working with your data. You do need to build up the capabilities first. And so, and so, maintaining that integrity of the data actually helps with the, again, I guess, the integrity of your decision making as well. And you're not, if you're the better quality of the data, the better quality of the decisions. And if you're making decisions on flawed data, yeah. you're going to make, you might make flawed decisions. Uh, and it actually may lead to, to discrimination in some regards, or it may lead to, um, yeah, unfair sort of practices. So I think the second part of the question was. Uh, do you have an opinion on the dilemma this raises for data owners and users, Simon? I don't know if you've got anything to sort of throw in on that. I don't think there's very much to add, but it is that you, you've really got to make sure that what you are using is valid, mm -hmm. and has veracity, if you like, mm -hmm. and um, before you even start trying to draw conclusions from, from, from that. Otherwise, you'll have a full space, so that testing is, is critical. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, another question that we've got here, um, current bargain is that the user gets a service for free in exchange for their data. How do you calculate whether this is a fair bargain or whether an individual should pay or be paid? Well, I've just had an, uh, an inquiry from a, 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 a fairly well-known um, polling organization asking me for some information about my, myself and my lifestyle. And they're offering me a, um, a Fifty pound voucher at the end of it to be given to a charity which they'll list out for me. Now, 
that incentivizes me to do it a bit more than I would otherwise because it's filling up questionnaires can become very boring. But there's an incentive there to do that. Um, uh, and uh, quite a lot of organizations are beginning to say, uh, if you help us with getting this data, we will do something for the benefit of society, in which you have some say. Yeah. It isn't the first time this has happened. What about, so say, in the context of, let's just pick that on sort of social networks, if you want to be a member of that social network, if you want to have, say, a Facebook account or a Twitter account, you, you need to sign up to the sort of terms and conditions. You don't pay to use Twitter. Um, but in kind of signing into your consent, uh, signing up to that account, you're giving your consent that your data can then be used. So, what about in terms of that? Whether do you think they, do you think this is fair, or do you think that there should be um, a pay or be paid type? I don't think necessarily that, but I do think in terms of conditions generally, those that specifically involve your privacy and uh, need your consent should be in bold type. To put it mildly, a slightly bigger type. Let's say most of us just sign at the bottom and think it's okay, but mm. we, we need to be a bit better informed about this, I think. Um, and that ties actually to another question that we've had. Um, are there any examples of good practice that you have of uh, um, the way that companies are approaching uh, the way they, inf they do this informed consent, uh, whether companies or industries? I think, I mean, I, we haven't researched this, but my perception as someone who uses websites is that, is that they are some of the bigger providers, Google, Facebook are getting better um, at explaining what, what they do um, in terms of things you click on and just making those easy to digest. Um, I don't know about, yeah, I don't know if, it, I don't know if it, in general it is getting better though. Mm -hmm. um, just conscious of time, I do, we have sort of seen up our half, uh, our seen our half hour, but there's one final question that's uh, uh, just caught my attention. It says that the word creepy is often used. Uh, for example, organizations should not be used as using data in a creepy way. Um, is there a way to tease out what creepy means in practice, in terms of good practice or bad practice? Do I really have an have opinion on that? <laughs> I think it's down to the personal again. I think it's part of what we covered earlier. Well, I think that the ordinary man in the street is, does feel a bit creepy when they see vast amounts of data and then told that that's being used to um, uh, focus um, particular things on individuals or on groups mm -hmm. and they they find that all a bit mysterious, creepy, mm -hmm. if you like. And I think some broader education in this area would be quite helpful by means of stories or something so yeah. people feel less daunted by, yeah. by giving information. I think if you haven't thought through how it appears to the outside world, I think that's where the creepiness comes in. I think there's particular stories that you think, oh yeah, that is surprising, you know, and where they obviously haven't thought about it from an external point of view. Yeah. Um, Great. Well, thank you so much. In the interest of time, we are going to have to stop it there. We do have more questions we haven't been able to respond to, but we will follow up with those by email. Um, so I think all that remains for me to say is to, is to thank Simon and to thank Olivia for joining us. Um, thank you for listening in. Um, just a reminder that the, the IBE's briefing can be downloaded for free from our website. Um, it is also in the handout section uh, of this webinar, so you have got a copy of that. Um, if you do want to carry on the conversation, uh, there's links to our Facebook, Twitter, and, and LinkedIn accounts there. Um, or do get in contact with the IBE. Um, we're happy to discuss any of these things with you further. Um, so I think that's all of it. For, that's it from us for now. We will um, put a recording of this webinar uh, onto the IBE YouTube channel shortly. Um, so do keep an eye out for that. But thank you for your time. Uh, wish you the best for the rest of the day. Thank you.